Welcome to Lit Poetry, the podcast where we go on a journey of discovery, reading, analyzing, and discussing great poetry from around the world. Poetry is worth it because the reading and writing of poetry is a revolutionary act that has the potential to transform both the reader and our world. Welcome to the Lit Poetry Podcast and today's poem, song, Sweetest Love I Do Not Go by John Doan. We'll begin by listening to the poem itself before returning to start our discussion with some biographical information about the poet. This poem is read to you by Richard Burton. Sweetest love I do not go for weariness of thee, nor in hope the world can show a fitter love for But since that I must die at last, is best to use myself in jest, thus by feigned deaths to die. Yesternight the sun went hence, and yet is here today. He hath no desire, nor sense, nor half so short a way. Then fear not me, but believe that I shall make speedier journeys, since I take more wings and spurs than he. Oh, how feeble is man's power, that if good fortune fall, cannot add another hour, nor a lost hour recall. But come bad chance, and we join to it our strength, and we teach it art and length itself for us to advance. When thou sighest, thou sighest not wine, but sighest my soul away. When thou weepst, unkindly kind, my life's blood doth decay. It cannot be that thou lovest me as thou sayest. If in thine my life thou waste, thou art the best of me. Let not thy divining heart forethink me any ill. Destiny may take thy part, and may thy fears fulfill. But think that we are but turned aside to sleep. They who one another keep alive, ne'er parted be. Born in 1572 to a London merchant and his wife, Doan's parents were Catholic at a time when England was deeply divided over matters of religion. Queen Elizabeth persecuted the Catholics and upheld the Church of England, established by her father, Henry VIII. The subsequent ruler, James I, tolerated Catholicism, but advised Doan that he would achieve advancement only in the Church of England. Having renounced his Catholic faith, Doan was ordained in the Church of England in 1615. Doan's father died when he was very young as did several of his brothers and sisters, and his mother remarried twice during his lifetime. Doan was educated at Hearts Hall, Oxford, and he became well educated there, speaking several languages and writing poems in both English and Latin. Doan's adult life was colourful, varied, and often dangerous. He sailed with the Royal English Fleet and served as both a Member of Parliament and a diplomat. In 1601, he secretly married a woman named Anne Moore, and he was imprisoned by his father, Sir George Moore. However, after the Court of Audiences upheld his marriage several months later, he was released and sent to live with his wife's cousin in Surrey, his fortunes now in tatters. For the next several years, Doan moved his family throughout England, travelled extensively in France and Italy, and attempted unsuccessfully to gain positions that might improve his financial situation. As I've already mentioned, in 1615, Doan was ordained a priest in the Anglican Church. In 1621, he became the Dean of St. Paul's Cathedral, a post he retained for the rest of his life. A very successful priest, Doan preached several times before royalty. His sermons were famous for their power and directness. For the last decade of his life before his death in 1630, Doan concentrated more on writing sermons than on writing poems, and today he is admired for the former as well as the latter. One of his most famous sermons contains the passage beginning, 
No man is an island, and ending, therefore ask for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. However, it is for his extraordinary poems that Doan is primarily remembered, and it was on the basis of this poetry that a revival of his reputation began in the 20th century, following years of obscurity. The renewed interest in Doan was led by a new generation of writers at the turn of the century, including T.S. Eliot. Doan was the leading exponent of a style of poetry called metaphysical poetry, which flourished in the late 16th and early 17th centuries. Metaphysical poetry features elaborate metaphysical conceits and surprising symbols, wrapped up in original challenging language structures with learned themes that draw heavily on eccentric chains of reasoning. A metaphysical conceit for example, is a complex and often lofty literary device that makes a far-stretched comparison between a spiritual aspect of a person and a physical thing in the world. Quite simply, a metaphysical conceit is an extended metaphor which can sometimes last through an entire poem. Doan's verse, like many of his contemporaries, exemplifies these traits. But Doan is also a highly individual poet, and his consistently ingenious treatment of his great theme, the conflict between spiritual piety and physical carnality as embodied in religion and love, remains unparalleled. So in this section of the podcast, we'll focus on the poem itself. When reading Doan's poems, one of the most important things to do is to try and understand the situation that prompts the poem. Doan is an amazing, dramatic poet, meaning that his poems are less about high-flown rhetoric and more about creating an immediate situation and responding to it. With this in mind, it appears that what prompts this poem is the speaker's impending departure, His lover does not want him to leave, and it seems that she is accusing him of leaving simply because he no longer loves her. Thus the first four lines, Sweetest love, I do not go for weariness of thee, nor in the hope the world can show a fitter love for me. The second half of the stanza is an attempt to lighten the mood, by telling her that his leaving can be thought of as helpful preparation for their eventual separation, death. Between the first and second stanza, it seems that his lover responds by asking him how long it will be until he returns. His answer is that even the son, who has no sense to be understood as understanding or human intellect, left the day before and returned. In saying this, the speaker is reassuring his lover that he, a man with intellect, sense and desire to return, will employ wings and spurs to hurry home as fast as he can. Between this stanza and the next, it can be imagined that his lover says something along the lines of, but the time you are gone will seem so long no matter how much you hurry. The speaker's reply is a recognition of the fact that while good times fly by quickly, a person is powerless to slow time or go back and relive those joyful hours. When something bad happens, Our own misery teaches it art and length, so that it seems even longer than it really is. In the interval between this third stanza and the fourth, his lover simply heaves a sigh. In medieval belief, it was thought that sighs and tears shortened a person's lifespan. Doan is famous in his poetry for drawing a connection between the two lovers by saying that they too are one single being, In this poem, it is no different. The speaker tells his lover that when she sighs, she is actually sighing his soul away because the sighing is a shortening of life and his life is intertwined with hers. And by sighing, she is shortening her own life. And that when she cries, it's the same thing. His life's blood doth decay. Therefore, in the second half of the stanza, he reproaches her for her sorrow by saying that she must not really love him 
if she is willing to shorten her own life by crying and sighing, and therefore shortening his, and taking from him the very best part of himself, which is her. Finally, between the fourth stanza and the last one, she in turn reproaches him, perhaps saying that she fears he will find another lover and never return to her. Thus, he tells her not to forethink him any ill, that is, not to predict his unfaithfulness, because by doing so it may actually become true. Instead, he tells her not to dwell on his absence, but to imagine that they are both in bed together, simply sleeping turned away from each other. The last two lines are potentially tricky with this interpretation, however, because the reference to keeping one another alive and thus never being parted seem to return to the previous stanza. The idea of keeping one another alive is a warning for her to resist sighing and crying because if she doesn't resist, she will waste both his life and hers. However, an alternative reading of the last stanza could be that rather than telling her not to doubt his faithfulness, she should not doubt his safe return because by imagining his potential death, she may will it to happen. In this case, the last two lines make sense with the rest of the stanza because by avoiding senseless fears she does not invite destiny's intervention and potentially keeps him alive. Welcome back. So to finish today's podcast, I just want to end by talking about the environmental themes and concerns I overlaid onto this poem when making the YouTube video for this particular piece of work. Clearly I was being rather cheeky in interpreting the poem through such a lens, but I do think it has some merit and I would encourage you to view the video if you haven't already done so. I love the fact that when it comes to art, meaning is in the eye of the beholder. We have the agency to read a work of art through different paradigms. So I will leave you with the idea that was floating around in my head and see what you think. What if the lovers in Doan's poem were not two humans, but rather they were a human being and the environment itself? seen as a kind of marriage of mutual respect and admiration that is now under threat because of changes in the environment and because one member of the union is parting ways with the other. I won't say if it actually works or not, but I'd love to hear your views in the comments section of the video. So it's time to conclude today's episode and say goodbye. I hope you enjoyed this week's poem. Next week we'll be featuring the poem To a Skylark by Percy Bysshe Shelley. To support our work, please subscribe to the podcast or to the YouTube channel. You can also visit our website at www.litpoetry.com. A video clip for this week's poem is now live on YouTube. We'll finish by listening one more time to the poem. Thanks for spending time with us and we'll see you next time. Sweetest love, I do not go for weariness of thee, nor in hope the world can show a fitter love for me. But since that I must die at last, is best to use myself in jest, thus by feign deaths to die. Yesternight the sun went hence, and yet is here today. He hath no desire, nor sense, nor half so short a way. Then fear not me, but believe that I shall make speedier journeys, since I take more wings and spurs than he. Oh, how feeble is man's power, that if good fortune fall, cannot add another hour, nor a lost hour recall. But come bad chance, and we join to it our strength, and we teach it art and length itself 
for us to advance. When thou sighest, thou sighest not wine, but sighest my soul away. When thou weepest unkindly kind, my life's blood doth decay. It cannot be that thou lovest me as thou sayest. If in thine my life thou waste, thou art the best of me. Let not thy divining heart forethink me any ill. Destiny may take thy part, and may thy fears fulfill. But think that we are but turned aside to sleep. They who one another keep alive, ne'er parted be. You've been listening to the Lit Poetry Podcast, presented by James Laidler. For more podcasts, poetry videos, and other useful resources, visit our website at www.litpoetry.com. Thanks for listening.